your mechanical advantage. When you're making a hand drill fire, it's all about the strength you have right here in your lats and pushing down on the hand drill at the same time to get friction. Okay, and that's difficult for most people to do in the beginning because it requires you to use muscles you don't normally use every day. With a bow drill fire, it's a little easier because it's common motions that you use every day. There's just more moving parts. But when you make a bow drill fire, the, the, when you're selecting woods, remember we talked about a lot of times, and we just, and we, Gordon just gave you a demonstration of it a minute ago. It really doesn't matter if you know what the material is, as long as you know what the material properties are you're looking for. Stringy barks are going to be good for cordage. They're also going to be good for tender. So if I can find a tree that has a stringy bark, inner bark or outer bark, it's going to work for a tender source. For bow drill fires, I'm really looking for something that I can drive my thumbnail into and leave a mark in the wood. If it's soft enough to do that, it's soft enough for a bow drill fire. You want to make your spindle and your board from the same material, if it's possible, okay? Because they will consume each other at an equal rate, for the most part. It's a little bit different because the wood's a little more dense going against going over the, in the end grain than it is going across the side grain like this. I'm sure the guys that's carving will talk to you more about that kind of stuff. But, so it's gonna be a little bit of a difference, but it's gonna be much better than two different types of wood altogether, okay? You want to find something that's going to be wide enough for your baseboard that you can, that it's a little bit wider than the drill that you're going to use to drill into it. Otherwise, it's gonna blow both sides of this thing out when you start drilling down into it, because the hole's gonna get increasingly bigger as the spindle goes down inside the hole and around. Okay? And the key to any friction fire, whether it's bow drill or hand drill is, especially in a survival scenario, if you absolutely had to do it is, the more time you spend on the front end, the less headache it's gonna be on the back end. Because if you make this set halfway and you don't do things exactly the way they should be done and you don't get a fire the first time, you've expended the major amount of the energy that you had the very first time. And every time you do it after that, it's gonna be more difficult you're gonna get more dehydrated, you're gonna get more tired, and you're gonna burn more calories every time you do it. So you really wanna to try to do it the first time every time. Now, I say that, and I'm working with unfamiliar wood here. I've never used this wood before to make a bow drill fire, so it may take me more than once, but hopefully I can read the material good enough to make it happen one time. So let's talk about reading the material real fast before we talk about carving a set. When we were making a fire here, that's very applicable and similar to what we talked about with the flint and steel, okay? Because what we're going to do is we're going to rotate this spindle with a reciprocating bow that's gonna turn it back and forth like this. And it's going to create friction and it's going to create heat, all right? Well, we have to first create friction because we need to drive material from the spindle and from this board into a notch that becomes our tinder source. Okay, you can't burn something that's not there. So the more heat you put on this thing right away, all you're doing is burning the material up. And there's nothing there to burn. So everything that comes out of this thing on the front end is gonna be burnt already. It's gonna be already burned, and no good to you. So you need to create a tinder bundle per se by loading this notch with material that you've driven off of here by friction without the amount of heat it would take to combust the material in the beginning because you wanna pile up the tinder. You want a big tinder bundle in this notch. Then you increase the speed so that you add heat to that tinder bundle and it will start to burn from the top and smolder. And because you're restricting the oxygen flow and you've got lots of surface area compressed in that ember, it becomes a smoldering piece of char. For, the, for lack of a better word, it becomes a big char, char pile on the ground, okay? And that becomes your ember. So what we need to do is we need to figure out, first of all, what materials we need, and then we need to look at how hard the materials are because all of that makes a difference. The harder the material is, the more downward pressure it's going to require to drive material out of here by friction. But again, speed is not, you know, I see a lot of people that go bat out of hell fast with a bow drill as soon as they get that thing married up and then they never get a number. And as soon as they slow down in the beginning, then they get a number, okay? So what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna act like this is a new set. We're not gonna use this hole. Um, we're gonna use a different hole. So the first thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to make sure that A, I got a flat surface on the front and I got a flat surface on the bottom so that when I put this on the ground, it's not going to rock back and forth. I want it to be stable when it's on the ground. Okay, so once we've got that, we want this board to be, again, at least the thickness of our thumb or a little bit more because we're going to drive a lot of material out. You can see how deep that's burned in there. 
I don't know how many fires that set's made. I'd venture to say one or two, maybe. And you're almost at the bottom of the notch, and once you get there, it's over. That You're going to have to start over again, okay? And that goes back to doing it right the first time. With our spindle, picture this thing as the number two pencil you used when you were in school. You're just about ready to take it to the pencil sharpener on this end because it's getting dull, but it's not to a point anymore. And you've been chewing on your eraser all day while you're sitting in class, and that's what this looks like. So this is chamfered off. It's not round, but it's not flat. It's kind of like a drill. It's got some facets on it, like I've been chewing on it. And this end looks like the pencil that's dulled up enough that I'm about ready to go to the pencil sharpener again. That's what you want this thing to look like, okay? And then with this, again, thickness of your thumb, wider than the spindle is that you're starting with, and you're ready to go. Let's talk about the bow real quick. The bow itself, which is the other main component of this set, <coughs> needs to be at least as long as your arm is to your fingers outstretched. The reason for that is the longer this bow is and the more of this bow length you have, the more revolutions you get with that spindle every time you stroke it. So it takes less of this to get the same result as a bow this long. I'd have to do this a lot more times to get the same amount of revolutions as I would get with this. But you don't want it too long because then it's going to have a lot of forward weight and it's going to tend to ride up and down the spindle. What you have to remember is that this is basically a drill. So if this is a drill and I have the bow canted this way, it's going to ride up the spindle. If I have it this way, it's going to ride down the spindle. So keeping this bow level while I'm turning the spindle is very important because it's gonna keep it in the center of the spindle. It's not gonna ride up, it's not gonna ride down, okay? The other thing that's really important is once you've made this thing, is to keep it dry. This end doesn't matter. This end's the one that matters. I always prop it up on something, my bow or my handhold or my board, whatever I'm not working on, to keep that end off the ground. The last thing, and this bow doesn't have to be straight necessarily. It doesn't have to be curved. It needs to be a hard wood that doesn't have a lot of flex to it because you don't want to be able to bend this thing to put the spindle in there because then it's going to be loose on you very quickly because green wood's gonna take a set. So if you get a piece of hard dry wood like this one is, so that's a very good bow. You can see it's got a fork in the top, so there's not a whole lot of complication there. I just put a loop over the top of that, come down to the bottom, put like a seven notch in there, like a steak notch, and tie multiple half hitches in there to get it to where I want it, okay? We'll mess with that if we have to in a minute. The last thing that we have to think about is our bearing block. And this is probably one of the most difficult things for people to create is this bearing block because it has such an importance on the set. Number one, it cannot burn at the same rate this does. Because if it does, it's going to burn up inside and the spindle's gonna be up in here and these shoulders are gonna be touching the sides and it's gonna be doing what's called shouldering out, which is gonna add friction to the top of the spindle and you want all the friction down here not up here, then it's become more difficult to run the bow. You want that bow to run very smoothly without a lot of effort. The more this gets up inside this bearing block, the harder it's gonna to be to get that. So you want a piece of hard green wood for this, okay? This one just happens to shape just almost exactly to my hand, right there, look at that, perfect, okay? It's a piece of hard green wood, and all I did was take my knife, like I showed you guys this morning, and I just carved it out enough that this is not gonna just jump out of it okay when I'm bearing down on it the next thing I need to prepare is my board what I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna do the same thing I did here I'm gonna take my knife and I'm going to start dead center I don't want to be too close to the end and I don't want to be too close to something I've already used because it'll just break out so I'm gonna start over a little ways over in here and I'm going to cut down into it and this is your first opportunity really to take a look at this wood and feel it under your knife and say is this stuff soft enough or is this stuff rock hard? And I need to cut a big enough divot or depression into this Sorry. piece of wood that this thing's not gonna jump out of there. Now, again, like everything else, the more you do this stuff, the more you'll know what you can get away with. The more you do it, the more you'll say, okay, well, that's deep enough, or it's not deep enough. If, I, if I'm not real good with my form and I can't put enough downward pressure on here, it's gonna jump out every time, I need to make it a little deeper. A lot of times what I'll tend to do is I'll marry the thing up with my hands a little bit before I even start, just to get that depression going in there, especially in softer wood, and just bear down weight on it and give myself a nice round divot for that thing to ride into, okay? Once I've got that done, the next thing I wanna do, before I go to the energy and of cutting a notch in this thing, I wanna marry this setup and burn into the wood and look at the color that that wood is. 
because before I expend more energy and use my tools again, take a chance on another injury by using my knife or my saw, I want to make sure this wood's going to work. And I can tell where it's going to work by the color it is when I burn it in. And that will also marry the setup so that everything rides smoothly because once I cut the notch in, it's go time. I'm going to put my foot on the board as close to the spindle as I can get it without touching the spindle because I don't want any friction there from my boot. But at the same time, I need this line right here to be very close because when I get ready to do this, what I'm going to do is I want my form to be... I want to be able to take this bearing block, put it on top of the spindle, and lock the crook of my arm and my hand right here into my shin to create a stable machine that's not going to fall. If this thing's doing this the whole time you're running it, you're never going to get a bow drill fire. All you're going to do is waller the holes out. So you want to make sure this thing's straight up and down so you get the best chance of it running well. And then I'm going to start really easy because I just cut that round in there until it's running smoothly. Then what I do is I keep my body pressure over the top of this thing so I can actually lean on my hand with my shin and I'm creating downward pressure. It doesn't have to come from here. I'm not muscling this thing. I'm using my own body weight to put downward pressure on this. If you spin this thing five times and you don't have smoke, you're not pushing down hard enough, okay? So I'm pretty positive this is going to work. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back and look at everything. I'm going to say, okay, was my bow slipping? If it was, my string wasn't tight enough. It wasn't slipping. I'm okay there. I've burnt this spindle right here. When I burned it, I charred it, which means I did what to it? I fire hardened it. Okay. Now it's harder than it was to begin with. So I'm going to come back in here. I'm going to get rid of that. If this happened to burn, I'm not touching that because I want this as hard as it can possibly be, okay? The only time I'm going to touch this is if I started to shoulder out in here and I've got to change something. This, this spindle is a little bit softer than the board, but that's typical. They may not have come from the same tree. I'm not going to worry about the very tip of it. I just want these chamfered edges to be clean because they're really what's going to contact the sides of this. I'm going to look at this thing and look at this and see if I'm already shouldering out because if there's a chance that that's happening even a little bit, I want to change that now. <coughs> so that I'm starting clean. And you can see this frayed bit on the top of this. That's because this must be a pithy plant. So it's got pith in the center of it, and that's what's fuzzing up on there. And that's going to cause you some problems with downward pressure because it's going to want to crush on you. Okay? In that case, you're just going to have to chamfer a little bit more further down the spindle a little bit. Not a big... I put a lot of downward pressure on this stuff, and you might not have to put that much downward pressure on it here in Australia. So I have to kind of key in on that while I'm doing it. All right. Here's my feeling on stuff like that. If you can't, if you can't do something on demand, then you don't own the skill. If you're afraid to do it in front of people, or you're afraid to do it live, then you don't own the skill. I'm confident I can get this one way or the other. I'll will it to fire. I'll start with my beard if I have to. <laughs> Guaranteed. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to create our notch. And for you guys with only a knife, you would do that rock and cut, and then you would just cut V-notches out on both sides until you got as deep as you wanted. What you really want with this stuff is you want this notch to be in kind of about a 30 to 45 degree pie shape on this board like this and you want the center of it to be just less than the center of your burn in okay so i'm just going to take my saw and cut straight into this thing do as i say not as i do you can use your knives to knife this or use sharp mowers because if you didn't have a saw that's exactly what you use if you didn't have a knife you'd have to use a flint tool or some other um, cutting tool to do this and I'm really just going deep enough with the saw that it would have been the same as my rocking cut. The rest of it I'm going to do with my knife. So now I'm just going to take my knife and start cutting that V-notch out of there. All the way down. To get what I want. Now there's lots of little tips and tricks with this that you can do to increase how much airflow you're getting to that ember. 
if you have very coarse woods or hard woods sometimes it's very good to open up the bottom of the notch a little bit here so that you can get airflow from underneath to take advantage of updraft depending on how coarse the material is sometimes your notch is going to need to be wider than other times sometimes it can be very narrow I like my notches to be about 45 degrees as a standard to start off with. Alright, so we're going to go with something like that. It's a little wider than a notch Gordon had in here. But that's the way I'm used to doing things. If it doesn't work, I'll blame myself for not knowing the wood. Let's see what happens. Okay? Now the next thing we need is something that we can catch our ember on. We don't want the ember going straight on the ground. We want that thing to go onto some type of material. So in this case, we're going to use a piece of paper bark for that ember catch. And then we want to find ourselves a very level piece of ground that this thing's not going to rock on. The advantage this one has is it has this kind of leg on the side of it, which gives it a lot of stability. Now, if this thing's going to lean one way or the other, I want it to lean toward the notch. Because I want the material to gravity feed over the top while I'm bow drilling, okay? So this is about perfect for that. All right, once I've got all of that, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I've got a tinder bundle handy. Something like that's more than enough for what we're doing, I think. And when I create this tinder bundle for my bow drill ember, it's a little different than when I'm using a piece of char cloth. I kind of want this thing to look like something a bird's getting ready to lay an egg in. Because that's what I'm getting ready to do. I'm getting ready to put an egg in here in that ember. When you've got char cloth, it's kind of a floppy, flippy thing. It doesn't fall apart very easy. You can just kind of shove it in there and taco it in. With an ember, it will tend to want to fall apart if you're not really patient with it. So you've got to be careful with that. So I'll set that tinder bundle aside. We're going to load up our bow here. And now we're going to see if we can make something happen. I'm going to cheat this a little bit backwards. Again, this comes with experience. I'm cheating this angle a little bit backwards to push into the material because I've got a notch that's pretty wide. Okay. And I'm going to bear down on it and just start to run it and see how it runs. I'm keep my foot over just a little bit more. And I'm looking for now, ooh, I'm looking for material to start building up in that notch. Dave's keeping the bow nice and parallel to the ground, as straight as possible. If there's any scooping, that's one of the major problems. So you want to keep that really parallel to the ground. All right. Now, we just take a break, okay? We don't get in a hurry now because we've got 10 minutes for that thing to burn. What we really want to happen is, well now we're going to take off our shirt, we're going to get relaxed here, <laughs> get rid of this merino wool that's about to burn me up. What I want that thing to do is I want it to cohesively come together into an ember. Right now it's just a pile of dust. I'm letting the air do the work for me and I'm not messing around with it. And I'm looking for it to turn into something that looks like the end of a cigar on the top. When it looks like that, then I know it's ready to go. <coughs> Man, have you ever smoked so bad you smoked yourself? <laughs> I'm going to need to shower tonight. Okay. There, you see it turning red down the top? See that? That red glow? That's, that's telling me it's go time. Now I'm going to move my tender bundle to the ember, not the other way around. I'm going to pick this up very gently, tilt this over, 
Sometimes in a cold, wet environment, you need to lift that off the ground early because of all that moisture to really suck the Remove energy. all this into here. And again, I'm not going to get in a hurry because all of that's burning. Now you can see here, this was almost a shouldering out phase right here. So it was getting harder and harder for me to push that bow. I could tell that as I went, that the bow was getting harder to turn. So that kind of gave me a signal, well, you better look at your notch and if there's some material in there, you better get after it because you ain't got much time before it's going to be really hard to push that bow. All of those little things you have to kind of read at the same time when you're doing this. But there's no doubt that's a good viable set. It made a huge ember. It's perfect. But you've seen that ember was sitting here burning on that gra on that paper bark, and the paper bark never caught on fire. Because there's oil in that paper bark like there is in birch. The oil won't burn, it only like melt the wood. It's like grease in the wood. But if you apply open flame to it, it's like it's dipped in diesel fuel at that point. It's gonna burn. Alright. Batter up. Okay.